One wonders if the winds were blowing the day Judge Cornelius Hanford platted the town that would bear his name. Did he give much consideration to the future of this little farming community nestled in the dry and open environment of the Columbia Basin? Or was it just another source of customers for his Hanford Irrigation and Power Company? How could he have known that this closely knit community would rise to 51,000 people and then, only 18 months later, become an abandoned remnant of what was? After 1942, the small towns of Hanford, White Bluffs, and Richland Village found their prosperity in the rich volcanic soils of the Columbia Basin. Orchards and farms stretched along the shores of the Columbia River. Family life was securely rooted within the communities. Wonderful. I couldn't think of a greater place to grow up, and, and all my friends say the same thing. We swam, we rode horseback, we climbed uh, Mount Gable, and horseback riding, <laughs> jackrabbit hunting, and you know, just normal things that kids do when they're that young. Our parents would take us to the Grange dances on the weekends, and of course they played cards, and you know, they always took their children with them. They didn't leave them home. Babysitters were out of the question. <laughs> we just had fun. We didn't have money, and of course we lived through the Depression in the 1930s, and we were just getting out of the throes of the depression when the uh, government came in and took our land. Things would have been different. But the winds of change were on the horizon. It was December 2nd, 1942. Only a year earlier, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor had plunged the United States into war. An elite group of scientists embarked on a secret mission called the Manhattan Project, a project to construct the world's first nuclear bomb. In order to make plutonium for the weapon, the government needed an isolated location, vast amounts of land, and a clean, abundant supply of water. When Lieutenant Colonel Franklin Mathias flew over the Columbia Basin, he found what he was looking for. Back in uh, Chicago, they had... Um the first chain reaction and Fermi was there and three months and four days later they were in our town of Hanford and we were told we had to leave. Of course they had come out there uh, unknown to a lot of us. Uh, the government men that came out um, we didn't see them and I kept thinking oh heavens they've discovered uh, oil or uranium or something in our back of our place west of our ranch because they uh, were digging and and we thought oh heavens we'll be rich yet but we didn't know that this was all transpiring well the people were they just had to leave there some were offered jobs and some of the personal accounts are that they felt guilty when they accepted a job because there was a lot of uh, very uh, real antagonism and it still remains in people I've talked to today uh, the who are whose parents were there and they were high school students at the time or still have a uh, resentment against the way they were treated we all lost each other basically we lost each other and then of course all the young men you know went into the service there's some accounts that are rather I guess we would say in retrospect a bit irritating that there was nothing there, just a few farmers, one church and that sort of thing. That's not true. There were farmers just beginning to get on their feet, as a lot of farmers were at that time. And um, their whole life was completely uh, disrupted. Do I call it home? Well, yes, I, I think so. I think so. The decision was made. The Columbia Basin would be a vital part of the war effort. Families moved out and the government moved in. As Camp Hanford grew from the abandoned towns, trailers came by the thousands and tar paper barracks rose overnight to house construction workers recruited from around the nation. But they couldn't tell us anything about Hanford. 
Nobody knew anything about it except that it was a, it was a war project. When we arrived here, something like 1 a.m., it was a long train, and so they stopped, and we all had to get off. And uh, they, they were there to meet us, and they're running all through all these crowds getting off of the train, when, saying, operations of construction, operation of construction. I mean, you know, no one had that name, but it sounded like it. There was three of us uh, drove from Helena, Montana, in a car, and we said, if they'll hire all three of us, we're going to stay. Otherwise, we'll get back in the car and drive home. Well, they wanted people real bad, so they hired all three of us. Dad was making big money, but missing the family, and thought he saw a future in the Northwest. We received the directions, sell the farm, buy a trailer house, and come to Washington. We left Springfield, Missouri, driving a 1937 Pontiac four-door sedan and pulling a 25-foot American trailer house. We had 13 flat tires between Springfield and Cheyenne, Wyoming. When we reached Cheyenne, Mom went to the local ration board to see about some decent tires. When they heard that we were on our way to Hanford, we were immediately authorized to purchase four new grade A tires. All you could buy otherwise were two-ply recaps. Those new tires saw us safely to Hanford. Our trailer had a sign on it that read, Hanford or Bust. Recollections from Robert Harmon. They were having some pro they were having major problems keeping employees, particularly women employees. <laughs> it was such a horrible place to live. And no one would stay. And you'd, they'd invested a great deal of money to hire people on the East Coast or anywhere they could find them to come out here. And people thought they were going to the great green Northwest. And they came here and found desert and dirt and dust and heat. It was hot. It was over 100 degrees. There was no air conditioning. And the wind blew and the dirt blew because they had a lot of land torn up. Uh, the stories are that a lot of people came and rode a bus to the site and got on the same bus going back to Pasco and didn't, didn't stay. Something over 120,000 people passed through the, the area as, a, as part of the construction. We were met by the greeters of DuPont, which they had at the station, and they brought us over here then in a cattle car. Well, transportation from Richland to Hanford was only in an old bus or what we used to call a cattle car. And the one I went up in was a cattle car. Now a cattle car is just like an enormous bus, except the seats are all run on the exterior, everybody's face in the center. But they call them a cattle car. And my mother said, you must come up here and work this summer. And I said, why? I already have a summer job here. No, you must come up from Corvallis and have this once-in-a-lifetime experience. Thank God it was only once. <laughs> I was in the barracks, but uh, the barracks were so small, it was uh, like being in a closet. Primitive, primitive. The women's barracks were just rattly barns and no air conditioning, of course. If you wanted some air, you opened the window, let the wind and the dirt and everything blow in. Well, the ads in the National Geographic prior 1940 magazines, National Geographic magazine, prior to 1940, have ads for the type of trailers that uh, they were living in out there. Um, they were advertised, I think it was Schultz trailers, they were advertised for weekend use. Um, they were not expected to live in long, for long term. Um, very thin walls, uh, little or no insulation, no indoor water in most of them. And you're making, you're making this great money. And that's why, and the only reason people stayed here, because they were making money. There was no place to spend it, so you, <laughs> I guess the bank did pretty well. 